what is ChatGPT? What is RLHF? Reinforcement learning with human feedback. What was that little magic ingredient to the dish that made it uh, so much more delicious? So we, we train these models uh, on a lot of text data. And in that process, they, they learn the underlying something about the underlying representations of what's in here or in there. And they can do amazing things. But when you first play with that base model that we call it after you finish training, it can do very well on evals. It, it can pass tests. It can do a lot of, you know, there, there's knowledge in there. But it's not very useful uh, or at least it's not easy to use, let's say. And RLHF is how we take some human feedback. The simplest version of this is show two outputs, ask which one is better than the other, uh, which one the human raters prefer, and then feed that back into the model with reinforcement learning. And that process works remarkably well with, in my opinion, remarkably little data to make the model your, more useful. So RLHF is how we align the model to what humans want it to do. So there's a giant language model that's trained on a giant data set to create this kind of background wisdom, knowledge that's contained within the internet. And then somehow adding a little bit of human guidance on top of it through this process makes it seem so much more awesome. Maybe just because it's much easier to use. It's much easier to get what you want. You get it right more often the first time. And ease of use matters a lot, even if the base capability was there before. And like a feeling like it understood the question you were asking, or like it feels like you're kind of on the same page. It's trying to help you. It's the feeling of alignment. Yes. I mean, that could be a more technical term for it. And you're saying that not much data is required for that, not much human supervision is required for that. To be fair, we understand the science of this part at a much earlier stage than we do the science of creating these large pre-trained models in the first place. But yes, less data, much less data. That's so interesting. The science of human guidance. That's a very interesting science. And it's going to be a very important science to understand how to make it usable, how to make it wise, how to make it ethical, how to make it aligned in terms of all the kind of stuff we think about. Uh, and it matters which are the humans and what is the process of incorporating that human feedback and what are you asking the humans? Is it two things? Are you asking them to rank things? What aspects are you uh, letting the, or asking the humans to focus in on? It's, it's really fascinating. But uh, how, uh, what is the data set it's trained on? Can you kind of loosely speak to the enormity of this data set? The pre-training data set? The pre-training data set, I apologize. We spend a huge amount of effort pulling that together from many different sources. Um, there's like a lot of, there are open source databases of, of information. Uh, we get stuff via partnerships. There's things on the internet. Um, it's a lot of our work is building a great data set. How much of it is the memes subreddit? Not very much. Maybe it'd be more fun if it were more. <laughs> uh, so some of it is Reddit, some of it is news sources, all like a huge number of uh, newspapers. There's like the general web. There's a lot of content in the world, more than I think most people think. <laughs> yeah, there is uh, like too much. Like it, where like the task is not to find stuff, but to filter out stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. What is, is there a magic to that? Because that seem, there seems to be several components to solve the... Uh, the design of the, you could say, algorithms, so like the architecture of the neural networks, maybe the size of the neural network. There's the selection of the data. There's the the uh, human supervised aspect of it with, you know, uh, RL with human feedback. Yeah, I think one thing that is not that well understood about creation of this final product, like what it takes to make GPT-4, the version of it we actually ship out and that you get to use inside of ChatGPT, the number of pieces that have to all come together. And then we have to figure out either new ideas or just execute existing ideas really well mm -hmm. at every stage of this pipeline. Um, there's quite a lot that goes into it. So there's a lot of problem solving. Like you've already said uh, for GPT-4 in, in, in the blog post and in general, there's already kind of a maturity that's happening on w some of these yeah. steps. Like being able to predict before doing the full training of well, how the model will behave. Isn't that so remarkable, by the way, yeah. that there's like, you know, there's like a law of science that lets you predict for these inputs, here's 
what's going to come out the other end. Like, here's the level of intelligence you can expect. Is it close to a science or is it still? Because uh, <laughs> you said the word law and science, uh, <laughs> which are very ambitious terms. Close to, I <laughs> Um, Close to, right. I, <laughs> be accurate, yes. I'll say it's way more scientific than I ever would have dared to imagine. So you can really know the uh, the peculiar characteristics of the fully trained system from just a little bit of training. You know, like any new branch of science, there's we're going to discover new things that don't fit the data and have to come up with better explanations. And, you know, that is the ongoing process of, of discovery in science. But with what we know now, even what we had in that GPT-4 blog post, like, I think we should all just like be in awe of how amazing it is that we can even predict to this current level. Yeah, you can look at a one-year-old baby and predict how it's going to do on the SATs. I don't know, uh, seemingly an equivalent one, but because here we can actually in detail introspect various aspects of the system, you can predict. 